Economic Policy Institute. My name is Christian Dorsey. I'll be your host for today. Uh, in my day job, I direct EPI's External and Government Affairs, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you here for this event on tipped workers and the tip minimum wage, something that is incredibly important, not just to working Americans, but to our economy as a whole, and we'll explore why. Uh, before I get into introducing today's event, there are uh, certainly some acknowledgments that I would like to make. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank our partner in presenting this event, the Restaurant Opportunity Center, Rock. We thank them for joining us in partnership, as well as uh, Unite Here, who has been instrumental in helping bring some talent to this event, who you'll hear from a little bit later on. I'd also like to thank the Ford Foundation, which has been an incredible partner to EPI in our work uh, in support of, of working Americans, and specifically uh, with this paper that you'll see uh, featured here as part of today's forum. As far as logistics for this uh, event, if anyone at any point needs to use the restroom, I would ask that you use the rear door, uh, which is behind you, and to, I guess, your right. Uh, you can walk down that hallway and you can find both the men's and ladies' rooms. I'd ask that you not use the front door during the time that we are in session. Uh, we are live streaming this event, so there are a number of people who couldn't make it here in person, but who are watching on the web. Uh, for them and for all of you, if you'd like to live tweet during this event, please use the hashtag tipped workers. We'd appreciate that. And uh, with those logistics out of the way, let's get into the substance of today's event. Uh, as I've done an informal survey of people to talk about uh, this issue, many folks are unaware that there's even a separate minimum wage for people who work in the hospitality industry. For most folks, there's just an understanding that there's the federal minimum wage and that's it. Uh, so one, uh, we want to explore what is this phenomenon of the tipped minimum wage, why it exists in our economy, what's the historical background for it, uh, and whether or not it actually meets the needs as it was developed and intended. So we want to make sense of this and figure out how the many rules that govern uh, the tip minimum wage, how well those are followed, whether or not the uh, tracking and reporting requirements are met to an adequate degree. Uh, we also want to explore the macroeconomic implications of the tipped minimum wage in our economy, what it does to living standards for the nearly 4.5 million Americans who work for tips, what it's like for uh, businesses who actually uh, work under this model and what the impact of the tip minimum wage is on federal and state budgets. We then want to look at the micro level and see what it's like for people who actually earn the tip minimum wage, uh, how it is that they're able to make ends meet, how they're able to provide for their families, what it's like for individual business owners who have to go about uh, understanding the myriad regulations and what it does to their business outcomes. And then finally, we just want to explore whether or not there is a better way forward, whether or not the way we are doing things now actually makes sense moving forward. So we've got a big agenda, uh, but we certainly have a wonderful group of people who are going to make it possible for us to explore these issues in depth. We're going to lead off with Laura A. Fortman, who is the Principal Deputy Administrator of the Wage and Hour Division at the United States Department of Labor. Laura and I were just speaking before uh, the event started. She is, uh, we know, new to the position, relatively new, been there a little bit over a year. She comes to us from Maine, so we have to ha extend our sympathies for these hot, humid Washington summers. Most people in Washington go to places like Maine during the summer, and she somehow didn't get the memo. But we are pleased that she's here because she brings an extensive background on behalf of vulnerable Americans in the workplace to her position at Wage and Hour. She joined the department in June of 2013. Prior to this, she was executive director for the Francis Perkins Center in Newcastle, Maine, an organization that's dedicated to achieving social justice for the treatment of workers. And uh, previously, she, prior to that appointment, she spent eight years as the commissioner of labor for the state of Maine, where she was engaged in a number of labor issues, including minimum wage increases, overtime protections, uh, child labor protections, and uh, breaks for nursing mothers. This is really just the culmination of what has been a life, uh, a life career uh, devoted to working on behalf of vulnerable workers. She's been involved with many organizations uh, such as NELP 
and uh, chairing the governor of Maine's workforce cabinet. She's just been committed to these issues at every step of the way and in every dimension uh, that we could value. And it's so important for us to have at the Department of Labor and in the wage and hour division people who get it. Because as I'm sure Laura will share with us, it's not just set it and forget it uh, in ensuring that people actually receive the full protections that the law affords them. So to open our event, it is my pleasure to welcome Laura Fortman. And the introduction probably took longer than my comments. So uh, thank you, Kristen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I, I unfortunately am only able to stay for, for a few minutes at the beginning. But the reason I'm here is because this issue is incredibly important to us at the Department of Labor and in particular at the Wage and Hour Division. As the video showed, many people do not even understand how the tip credit works. So I'm delighted uh, that there is now a video that can help explain it uh, to folks. The 213 has been frozen in place since 1991. Um, and I, I know, uh, and we'll be hearing, uh, all of you will be hearing from some workers who can talk about the impact that that has on their lives. For those of you who don't know about Wage and Hour, we are um, in a division at the Department of Labor. We're responsible for enforcing labor laws such as minimum wage, overtime, child labor. Our responsibility is for 135 million workers at 7.3 million establishments. Um, we have 1,100 roughly investigators, which means we can't be every place all the time. So what we do is we use our resources strategically to identify areas where um, we see high rates of violation. We do not want to be out uh, you know, spending resources in places where um, people are in compliance with the law. We want to go where there's a high likelihood that there are vulnerable workers and uh, laws are not being um, complied with. And so that's one of the reasons why we pay careful attention to what's happening in restaurant industries um, across the country. For example, in 2013, we conducted 3,875 investigations at full service restaurants and found minimum wage overtime or record keeping violations. Um, which resulted in a little over $26 million in uh, back wages. Now, for some people, $26 million sounds like a lot of money, and for other people, they're saying, wait a minute, that's not very much. If that's all you're finding, why are you spending your time on that industry? Well, when you look at the, the low wages that you're collecting, that is a lot of money. Also, we found that in um, full service restaurants where we're doing investigations, that there's an 80% violation rate. So that means if you're finding violations that high, we have a responsibility to be there. Now our ultimate goal is always compliance. We wanna make sure people understand the law and that they're in compliance with the law. So we also spend um, a considerable amount of time doing outreach and education <coughs> Our goal is not to play gotcha. Our goal is to make sure that a fair day's pay, a fair day's work results in a fair day's pay. That's what it's about. People are working hard and they need to be paid. And so that's how we see our job and making sure that everyone understands the rules. Um, as has already been pointed out in the video, tipped employees are the only group of workers who rely on the customer to pay their wages. <clears throat> and um, as I'm sure you'll talk about during the day, some states have changed their laws uh, to uh, provide greater coverage for these workers. Some states, uh, um, although most states still uh, uh, adhere to the 213 for the uh, tipped wage. The president was also very concerned about this issue. And back in February, he issued an executive order on minimum wage for government contracts. And in that, there is a provision for tipped workers, and it will raise their wages um, to 70% of the um, minimum wage that will be included in the executive order. So it'll be 70% of 1010. Now, that will be phased in over time. 
January 1, 2015, it will bring the tipped uh, wage up to $4.90. So uh, it's for those federal contracts. So that's not everyone. Unfortunately, um, uh, the president can't just unilaterally um, make this change, uh, except in areas that he can control through executive order. And uh, so that's, those are the steps that he's taking. That minimum wage executive order, uh, wage and hour, is responsible for promulgating regulations to enforce that. And we are in the rulemaking process right now. And uh, July 28th, which I believe is Monday, is the final day of comments. Uh, so if there is anyone who wanted to comment on that, there is an opportunity for you to do that. So um, I know that uh, there are, uh, you want to really get to the meat of the conversation here today, um, but I did want to just make sure that uh, you knew that we do understand the issue at Wage and Hour. We are committed to enforcing the law um, and uh, we'll be very interested in hearing what comes out of today's discussion as well as the research that I'm looking forward to reading that has been done on this topic. I just wanted to, um, I'm sure you'll hear lots of statistics today, but it wouldn't be the Department of Labor if I didn't toss out a few statistics, um, such as you know uh, when you're looking at the demographics of people who are earning um, these wages, that you are primarily talking about adults, one in three in parents, one in six of those rely on free lunches to help feed their children, um, and that um, only seven states require employers to pay their tipped workers the same as the minimum wage for all workers. So uh, that's a little bit about, um, about the demographics. And I wanted to just uh, close with a quote from the president. When he signed this minimum wage executive order, and people are saying, you know, why are you doing this? What he said was that there's a simple moral principle at stake. If you take responsibility and you work as hard as these folks work, if you work full time, you shouldn't be living in poverty. Not in America, we believe this. Um, so thank you for um, everything that you are doing to uh, help understand this issue and make sure that a fair day's work results in a fair day's pay. In terms of, and thank you for phrasing it that way, I mean, we have a responsibility to enforce existing law, um, and that's kind of, you know, our responsibility. But in terms of studies, uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, it was 75 years old last year, and as part of our celebration, we commissioned a, a number of research projects to help us really look at what is happening with vulnerable workers. Um, we do have a website with the, that research posted on it, um, and many of the people in this room contributed, uh, you know, to those research papers. <laughs> okay, I can't get out of it without Heidi. <laughs> Heidi. Heidi Hartman, IWPR. I noticed recently, due to Stephen Greenhouse's article about the Apple retail workers suing Amazon, that Apple Corporation is suing Amazon for the cost of hiring. True. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, as Heidi said, uh, the uh, federal law does not require that. Um, but what happens is whichever law is most protective is the one that applies. So if you're in a state that has, well, you know, a minimum wage that's higher, that's the, the 
um, the wage that's required to be paid. However, the federal Department of Labor does not enforce that. The state would be enforcing it. One of the things that we have done during this administration is form, um, uh, we, we have signed MOUs with, at this point, 15 states to do a better um, job of coordinating um, our activities um, around enforcement uh, so that we can have those conversations at the state level and determine uh, who has the, um, the either the better resources, the better law to make sure that um, vulnerable workers are receiving uh, the most protection that they can. One more quick one, or okay. is, that, is that enough? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, there are only two questions. Let's see if I can answer them. Oh, Yeah, uh, we do not I have a breakdown of that at this point, um, so I really I can't answer that. Um, and I'd be willing to bet that there are people in this room, though, who are looking at at that research. So you identified a research opportunity, mm -hmm. and Larry. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for coming. Uh, you mentioned that your restaurants. Um, and, and again, I want, to, I want to frame it, and coming from researchers, I know that you'll appreciate this. That was 80% of full-service restaurants where we had an investigation. So that's a, a very small subset that is not, there's an 80% violation rate at all restaurants across the country. Um, so, um, and, uh, so I wanted to be clear about that part. Um, the other thing is getting back to Heidi's question about, you know, what's your relationship with states. One of the things that we've done in this administration is really start using a strategic enforcement approach. So we're always looking at um, places where there's a likelihood of violation. So we start screening from the beginning and um, of putting our resources in those areas where there are either low-wage workers um, or where the workers do not have a private right of action. Uh, and so we're in industries that have a vi high violation rate. Does that make sense? So it's unfair to um, kind of make a sweeping statement about the violation rates in those industries generally. I, I don't know that I would use the word target. I would say that <laughs> that through our um, our analysis, oh, yes, yes, or through our um, through a combination of you know the data that we have, we spend um, a lot of time in agriculture, in retail, in um, construction, in. Um, uh, janitorial services. We look for uh, areas where there is a uh, disconnect in the employment relationship. So as um, my boss, David Weil, talks about the fissured workplace. So looking in areas where there's a high likelihood uh, that workers um, are not um, being uh, paid um, appropriately. My sense is the Q&A portion could have gone on for quite a while, but we appreciate that you've got the people's business to get to. Uh, next, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the two authors of the uh, paper that you see uh, on this title screen, 23 Years and Still Waiting for Change. Uh, an examination of tipped workers in the, uh, in the macro economy, along with a, uh, a pretty bold recommendation that's included in the subtitle, not to give anything away. Uh, but let me introduce the two authors of this report who will present it to you uh, this morning. 
Uh, Sylvia Allegretto is a labor economist and co-chair of the Center uh, on Wage and Employment Dynamics at the uh, renowned Institute uh, for Research on Labor and Employment at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Dr. Allegretto has received her PhD in economics from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and early on in her career uh, was a uh, renowned economist here at the Economic Policy Institute and was a co-author for several editions of our seminal State of Working America, uh, most recently in 2011. She joins with us on a lot of our work on the minimum wage, having authored a uh, paper recently in the anniversary, the 50th anniversary on the March on Washington, and looking at the minimum wage in the context of that as a civil rights demand, and has done at least a couple of iterations, uh, co-authored uh, work on tip workers uh, in conjunction with EPI. We are pleased that even though she no longer calls this her day job place of employment, she maintains a status as a research associate here at the Institute, and we are thrilled that she joined us from the Bay Area here today. And her co-author is David Cooper, who has been with EPI since 2011, and Dave conducts uh, national and state level research on a variety of issues and is really our go-to uh, expert on the minimum wage and other wage issues. Dave's uh, research and work holds a unique place here at EPI, not just looking at national level issues, but with a particular emphasis and expertise on how it relates to the states. So he is really our minimum wage, our state expert, and we are so pleased that he brings his talents to this work and uh, we are pleased that both of them are going to present and walk you through uh, this paper, which we hope is making a meaningful contribution to the uh, low-wage worker debate. So I'll bring it up, Dave and Sylvia, to, uh, to do their thing. Good morning. It's always wonderful to be back at EPI. I did uh, used to reside here and used to raise a little hell and was in charge of happy hours and stuff like that. And every once in a while, I would do something good like the state of working America. Anyway, it's, so it's, it's always great to be back here. But this is truly amazing, you know, to think about this 213, right? Because just imagine if you're, you know, if you owned a business like a restaurant, right? And I told you that for a large share of your workers, you're going to be paying them the same that you're paying them today in 2000, you know, uh, 2037, at least until 2037. You'd think that's kind of crazy, right? You'd think, well, what a boom that would be for me if I was a restaurant owner, right? But this is what we're talking about. It's 23 years since we have had an increase in the federal um, minimum wage. So let me back up just to, get, to give a little bit more history about this. So in the, in the original Fair Labor Standards Act, there were a lot of workers that, that weren't covered. Hotel workers, other service workers, a lot of tip workers, rest, restaurant workers. So in the 1966 amendment, they, they widened the umbrella to cover these workers, but then they said, we're going to pay you less. We're going to allow for a sub-minimum wage. So this is, this is kind of the history, right? So this is kind of what we're talking about. It started in 1966. Now this figure is adjusted for prices, but this is what we're dealing with. So in 1966, this is when this started, then we had this um, two-tiered system. And the, and the way this works is that you have what we call a tip credit. Well, who does the tip credit? The tip credits the employer, right? So yes, feel free to, to shout out uh, <laughs> the answers. So what we have is that you have this situation where you had uh, the tip credit here is the red, or the tip wage is the red line, and the black line is the regular minimum wage, and you had 50-50. That's what the original ruling said, that the employer would pay half of the minimum wage to tipped workers, half of the regular minimum wage, and the customer portion would pay, the customer tips would subsidize the wage bill for the employer for the other half to get the worker to the regular minimum wage. That's what we're seeing here, 50-50 in 1966. It never went below, um, the actual wage actually got up to being around 60% at one point, so the tip credit at one point was even smaller, about 40%. But then we have this situation, right, that happened in, in, in 1991, the, the, the subminimum wage was 213, 
And in 1996, we had a minimum wage bill signed under President Clinton, Clinton and under much uh, pressure from the restaurant association lobby, where you had the subminimum wage then frozen into perpetuity, right? So it was 1996 wage bill, but it had been 213 since 1991, right? So what you have is that the, uh, you know, exactly what we see here in the picture, that you have the tip wage now is the lowest ever on record because of this e continual erosion over 23 years. And it's only 29%. So instead of 50%, like the original bill, now the tip wage is only 29% of the uh, uh, minimum wage. And the tip credit is 71%. So customers now are paying the lion's share of the wage bill for the employer, right? That's the employer subsidy. So again, we have this long-term decline, and you know we don't have anything right now to change this. I mean, hopefully the Harkin Miller bill will or something, but you know it's a it's a very long long-term trend. So like the minimum wage, as you know about like the minimum wage, we have states that have have, have um, enacted policies that are above the federal level. So the federal minimum wage seven twenty-five, the federal tipped minimum wage two thirteen, the federal tip credit is five. Um, 12, right? So what this shows is the different scenarios that we have. And the it's kind of hard to see, but in like, like here in New Mexico, for instance, where you see these black dots that show up, that, those are the states that have higher federal regular minimum wages, so higher than 725, right? And then you have the red states here, and there are about 19 of those, covering just under a third of all tipped workers who follow the $2.13 an hour. Those are the red states, right? And then you have, that has been mentioned, the seven green states. Those are states, like where I'm from in California, that don't allow for a sub-minimum wage for tip workers. So tip workers also get the regular minimum wage. By the way, most of these states, as you can see, have higher minimum wages. So not only do they not have a sub-minimum wage, they have a higher uh, regular minimum wage, such as in California, where, for, where I am now, a $9 minimum wage, or Washington State is nine thirty-two, a big difference from $2.13, right? So uh, the green states cover about 18% of the workforce. And then we have these blue states in between, which I call these partial tip credit states. There are about 25 of them, where they have their, their sub-minimum wages higher than the 213, but below the binding state minimum wage. For instance, here in DC, right? Um, how much do wait staff make in DC? 277, you get the prize. So uh, $2.77 has been for a long time here in DC. I'm, I've, I've all often wondered why it's such a 277, but that's what it is. Um, and you have a minimum wage here of, of 950, so you have a pretty big tip credit of over 670, right? 673. Um, but it's all across the board. You have Illinois that pays a sub-minimum of 4.93 with a minimum wage of 8.25 for a $3.30 tip credit. So we have all types of um, different scenarios across the country. So as, a, as an economist, we have uh, you know kind of a natural experiment going on. Matter of fact, my old uh, research ass assistant here, uh, is, uh, Rachel West, is, is here now. She's, she's, she resides up stairs at CAP, and she's helped me with a lot of my academic research on this topic. But we have like a natural experiment going on, right? So it's clear, um, at the very least, it's clear that the restaurant industry does not hinge on paying $2.13 an hour to tip workers. Otherwise, you wouldn't think there'd be any restaurants, full-service restaurants, in states like California. But I promise you that there are. There are a lot of restaurants in California and in Washington State, right? So, um, th so that's that's one of the one of the most important things. But and uh, you know, just I want you to keep in mind because we're in D.C., where I know all you folks are out. You know, going for you know a couple martinis after work and having your dinner and usually spending other people's money, so you're tipping really well. <laughs> but you know, you're in the you're in the little bubble here, right? Um, so I want you to keep in mind that's not most tip workers, right? Even most uh, uh, restaurant workers. Um, you have to really think about you know uh, the mostly women who you know the, working at a diner in rural Pennsylvania where I'm from or a Denny's in Youngstown, Ohio, or somebody working at a 24-hour truck stop in Nebraska, right? These are the people that we're really talking about here. 
So um, it, it, one of the reasons that, 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 that David Cooper and I you know, look at this, and I think this is so important, is the restaurant industry is booming. Since is the full service restaurant industry since 1990 is up over 80 percent, and put it to put that into context, private sector is up about 25 percent. So these workers, there's more of these workers. It's becoming a larger and more important uh, sector in the overall labor force. So we should take a, a, a closer look at it. So just to motivate. Uh, what my wonderful co-author uh, David Cooper is going to come up here and talk more about the substance of the paper. We have over, you know, four million uh, uh, tip workers nationwide. Most of them are in the food service industry. The majority of them, by far, are women. So this is definitely a, a women's issue. These are not all teenagers by any stretch. You know, an average age of uh, 33. Most are over 25 years of age. And of course, we have a lot of parents. So. Um, this is another reason why I just think we need to really take a really strong and really hard look at this industry, this growing industry that's becoming so important to see how workers are faring, something that the economic policy is brilliant at. So I was glad to contribute. But let me hand this off now to uh, um, my wonderful co-author to really get into kind of some of the meat of the, our research. Thanks, Sylvia. I'm David Cooper, uh, star of such films as What's Wrong with America's Tipping System. Uh, so, as as Sylvia mentioned, um, this is a you know this is a growing portion of the workforce, and that's really why we need to look at this issue and understand what life is like for these workers. Um, and the important thing to keep in mind when we talk about tipped work is that really, no matter how you look at it, tipped work is low wage work. Uh, you know, there's Sometimes the, the industry and, and some folks like to paint this picture that tipped workers are doing just fine, that they're, you know, that these, they're earning these great tips that you know, give them a really great wage. And, and, and uh, you know, that may be true for some high performers in fine, fine dining restaurants or you know, high-end casinos or things like that. But as Sylvia mentioned, that's really not the workers that we're talking about here. There's always going to be high performers in any industry. The vast majority of these workers are not doing that well. So this table that I'm showing here uh, shows the median wage of all workers nationwide, then tipped workers, and specifically waiters, waitresses, and bartenders, because as Sylvia mentioned, they make up the, the bulk of tipped employment. Uh, it shows the breakdown by gender and also by the state level of the state tip minimum wage in those states. And there's really three takeaways from this chart. The first thing that you see is that, as I said, Tipped wages are not high wages. Uh, the median wage for tipped workers nationwide at 10.22 per hour is equal to roughly 60% of the median wage for workers overall. Uh, even in the best case scenario for male waiters and bartenders in states where they're getting the regular minimum wage, the median wage is only $12 an hour. So that's still in the bottom third of the wage distribution nationally. The, even for the, you know, the, the best category in this table, it's, it's not really that much money. And in the worst case, for female uh, waitresses and bartenders in states where they get the 213 tip minimum wage, the median wage is only $9.14 per hour. Uh, if that wait, if waitress or, or bartender works 40 hours a week uh, year round, their annual income is less than $19,000 a year. Um, so this is not a lot of income. The second takeaway, the important thing to notice is that if you look, there's a very clear progression in the wages for tipped workers between the low tip minimum states and the high tip minimum states. And, and I should note that these numbers here are, are both base wages in, and tips. So it includes the tips that they're getting. And what you see is that as you increase the base wage for these workers, their, their total hourly pay goes up significantly. Waiters, waitresses, and bartenders in states where they get the regular minimum wage make 20% more than at the median than workers in the 213 states. And I think that this really directly contradicts, contradicts some of the claims made by folks that, oh, if, if we eliminated the tip minimum wage, that somehow these workers would be worse off because people would tip less and, they, you know, and their, their total take-home pay would go down. Well, clearly we see that that's not true. Uh, in the states where they're already getting full minimum wage, these workers are doing significantly better. The third thing that, that I'll just note from this table is that we do see uh, a gender gap 
uh, for these workers. That even though women make up the majority of tipped workers, they do tend to make less than men. Uh, and this is true in, in any of the categories represented, although I will note that the gap between the male and the female uh, median wage is smaller in the states where they're getting the regular minimum wage. Another thing to think about, and I'm sure that some of the other speakers we have today will, will talk about this, is that tipped workers, by and large, do not get benefits. Uh, and unfortunately, we weren't able to, to get data on tipped workers specifically, but what this graph shows is the receipt of benefits, things like health insurance, life insurance, paid vacation, paid sick time, uh, for the overall private sector, that's the dark blue line, and then for workers in the accommodation and food service sector, which of course is where the bulk of, of tipped employment resides. And what you see is that workers in accommodation and food service, for virtually all of these benefit categories, they're receiving those benefits at, at either half or less than half the rate of, work, of workers overall in the private sector. And again, because this isn't just tipped workers we're talking about, we're, we're looking at all workers in accommodation and food service, this also includes management in, in that sector. So if we were to just look at tipped workers uh, without management, these rates would be even lower, presumably. Um, and that's really, I mean, when I think about that, particularly in the case of, of paid sick leave, I mean, that really, that frightens me. I mean, I, I think that that should be very worrisome for folks that when you go out to a restaurant, the person who's serving you food doesn't get paid time off from their employer to stay home and get healthy when they're sick. And because so much of their wages is dependent upon the tips that they make, the incentive is for them to work when they're sick, when they're going to interact with the most customers, and to potentially take time off and get healthy on shifts when they wouldn't act, interact with as many people. I mean, that's, that's completely perverse incentives uh, in terms of public health. And so, you know, as I've been saying, because these workers get such low wages and, and uh, you know, no benefits, we see that their poverty rates are significantly different than workers who are getting paid the regular minimum wage. Nationwide, the poverty rate for tipped workers is 12.8% compared to a, a nationwide poverty rate for non-tipped workers of 6.5%, so almost double. And if we look just at waiters, waitresses, and bartenders, their poverty rate is more than double the poverty rate for non-tipped workers at 14.9%. But the important thing to note here is that, as Sylvia mentioned, there's seven states where these workers are paid the regular minimum wage, where they're not getting the, the 213. And the difference in poverty rates between workers in those states and the states where they're getting 213 is dramatic. If you look at the overall poverty rate for tipped workers in states where they're getting 213 an hour as their base wage, it's 14.5%, compared to a poverty rate uh, for those workers for overall, for tipped workers in states where they're getting the full minimum wage, it's, it's 18 point, excuse me, 10.8 percent, so four percentage points lower almost. If you look just at waiters, waitresses, and bartenders, the poverty rate in the states where they get the regular minimum wage is eight percentage points lower than in the states where they're getting 213 per hour. So that's a dramatic reduction in poverty for these workers, and it's important to note that. The poverty rate for workers, for non-tipped workers, between those three categories of, of states, the three st uh, state, tip minimum, uh, state tip minimum wage policies, the non-tipped worker poverty rate is virtually the same across all of them. So what that tells us is that very clearly it's the base wage, it's the higher base wage that these workers are getting that's leading to a significant reduction in poverty, specifically among tipped workers. Now because, uh, you know, because of their higher poverty rates and the lack of benefits, uh, you know, these workers tend to have to rely on public assistance a lot more than non-tipped workers. Um, what this table shows is that for tipped workers, uh, about 46 percent of tipped workers have to rely on some form, some form of public assistance compared with only about 35 percent of, of workers overall. Um, so as, as Christian alluded to in his opening remarks, this means that more tax, that tax more taxpayer dollars are going to subsidize wages at these uh, restaurants and tipped employers because these workers are not getting enough through their, uh, through their time in the labor market. And so, you know, I think a lot of this, as the workers that we're going to hear from are going to talk about, part of the problem is that because they're getting such a low base wage, because so much of their income is dependent upon tips, there's really no way for them to budget or plan. Their income levels can vary dramatically from week to week. 
And imagine trying to figure out if you can afford a new car payment or rent at a new apartment or, say, tuition at a, if you want to go back to school when you don't know what your income's going to be from week to week. It's impossible to budget. And as the video that we showed at the beginning uh, mentioned, I, I used to work for TIPS, and I remember days when I would drive into the restaurant and I'd see that I'd been given the, the patio section at the restaurant, and a thunderstorm would roll in, and they'd shut down the patio, and I'd have to sit there for two hours not working because the law required that if they called you into work, you had to be there for at least two hours. So I'd, sit, I'd just sit around for two hours and then go home, having not made any money because they'd closed my section. And that's just the way it goes uh, in that industry, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about that. So, you know, for all these reasons, we think that, uh, that this system needs to change. Um, and as, uh, as Laura Fortman mentioned, uh, you know, there's a bill in Congress right now, the Harkin-Miller bill, that would raise the tip minimum wage up to 70% of the regular minimum wage. We certainly think that's a step in the right direction, but given the experience of tipped workers in these states where they're already getting the full minimum wage, we think it's time to just do away with the tip minimum wage altogether. Have these workers be paid the regular minimum wage. We know that it's, that it's leading to better outcomes for these workers and that the restaurant industry is still thriving in those states. Uh, so we should just give them the full minimum wage and, and let tips go back to just being an expression of gratitude uh, for, for good service as opposed to being the bulk of these workers' paychecks. Thank you, Dave and Sylvia. The data that you presented is really a collection of many individual stories. And we would be remiss if we didn't actually delve into those individual stories as part of today's conversation. So we're very thankful that joining us today are a few people to tell their stories. And first, we're going to have Marcy Gardner, who is a, a worker at a local DC restaurant, uh, one that's probably considered upscale, right? Marcy, you know, place where, you know, $16 burgers, right? That's upscale, <laughs> right? So, you know, we're not, talking, we're not talking a place where you're talking about low, low bills and therefore subsequently low tips putting people in peril. We're talking about a place where there's a fair amount of money flowing per check, yet Marcy is still here to tell her story. So we welcome Marcy to the stage. Uh, Marcy also uh, does some advocacy work with the Restaurant Opportunity Center, and we look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Marcy Gardner. I'm 29 years old, and I'm a waiter at a wine bar here in D.C. Uh, I moved to D.C. last year in January 2013 to take a congressional internship as part of my master's degree program. And when I graduated in May, I found that I could not find work, and it became essential for me to return to the restaurant industry in order to pay my bills. Um, as a recent college grad, it's really hard. I went to college so that I could escape this exact kind of life. Um, but when I graduated, we'd fallen on hard times. We could not even afford a gallon of milk, let alone pay rent, when I decided it was time to stop looking for real jobs and apply to uh, service industry jobs. In two days, two days, I'd gotten my job. Um, but the really sad part is that despite my willingness to do whatever it takes to pay my bills, I still have a hard time making ends meet. Good times are okay. In good times, I can put away enough money into my bank account to pay my bills and to put food on the table. Um, but in hard times, going to my kitchen to make dinner can look like a mystery box challenge from MasterChef. Like, it's just, what can I do to make this work? Um, and the worst part is, of the shifting seasons, there is no warning when the winds are going to change. As has kind of been alluded to here today, um, my income depends entirely on how many people come into the restaurant, not on how many hours I spend there. The exempt minimum wage is a serious part of this problem. Uh, actually, before college, I used to work at a restaurant outside of Portland, Oregon. That's my hometown. Um, and that's where uh, tipped workers receive 100% of the state minimum wage. Currently at $9.10 an hour, management is forced to consider the cost of labor when they do their scheduling. 
Um, so they adjust in time. Some people come in at four o'clock, some people come in at five o'clock, some people come in at six o'clock. And then when the dinner rush is over, they start sending people home. And yes, this does result in shorter hours, but you know what? It also results in more money in workers' pockets for the time that they spend at work. Um, it results in a higher hourly wage that is significantly different, and it results in a significant, significantly different um, quality of life for people who work in restaurants. This is not the case in DC. At $2.77 an hour, service staff is practically free labor. And the thing is, management knows that. There's no incentive for them to cut labor when business is slow, resulting in excessively long hours and little payoff for employees. Just this last Saturday night, in the first four hours of my Saturday night shift, from 4 o'clock until 8 o'clock at night, I had served four people. Four people, and not a single person was cut off the floor. All three of us were kept until midnight at close, including the guy who had been there since 10 o'clock that morning serving brunch. What's worse, it's commonplace for management to cut at more expensive employees, such as host staff who are not tipped, and expect the uh, service staff to pick up the slack. It's simple. The exempt minimum wage disincentivizes business efficiency, it encourages consistent overstaffing, and rewards abusive practices towards workers. It's got to stop. The restaurant industry is one of the largest and fastest growing uh, job sectors in this country. But Americans don't just need any old jobs. We need good jobs. Raising the tipped minimum wage to 100% of the minimum wage will reward hard work with good wages and the respect of a job well done. And Rock United is looking to do that right now for workers here in DC. We're working on putting together a ballot initiative to get um, the option to raise the minimum wage, the tipped minimum wage to 100% of the minimum wage uh, on the ballot so that voters have a choice. We need signatures and we need help collecting them. If anyone here is looking for a next step to help abolish the tipped minimum wage, this is it. And together, we can achieve one fair wage. Thank you, Marcy. And I should note that we'll have an opportunity to engage in further discussion with all of the speakers uh, who, who remain uh, as soon as they've all delivered some remarks. So uh, get your questions and comments ready because we will have time for that discussion. I'd now like to welcome Amber Grindon, who works uh, for a restaurant, uh, Phillips, right, Amber? So a seafood restaurant uh, at BWI Airport. Uh, Amber is the uh, sole breadwinner in her family. So. Uh, she has to work in an environment where there are lots of customers, it's fairly consistent, yet she's also here to tell her story. So we welcome Amber Grindon. Oh, you know my name already. <laughs> and I've worked at BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport for the past five years as a server at Philip Seafood. I'm paid the Maryland minimum wage for tipped workers, which is $3.63 an hour. The restaurant industry is growing at the airport and throughout the country because of all our work. But even though the industry is growing, our minimum wage has been stuck at 363. It's difficult to get by when you have to depend on tips. Our tips are very seasonal. That means that for half the year I feel like I can take care of my family, and the other half the year I feel like I have to just scrape by. There is no security. I don't know how much money I'm gonna will make each week from week to week. For the past two years, my husband has been too sick to work, and I have been the only one working to support us and our 10-year-old son. Having to rely on tips limits anything I could do to plan for the future. Right now, I need to buy a new car, but I can't because I don't know if I'll be able to afford the payments all year round. Recently, the mobile home park I lived in was sold, and we were all told that we had to move within eight months. They sold the land to build $300,000 homes. Before, I owned my own mobile home and only had to pay $5.50 for lot rent each month. But now the most affordable place I was able to find to rent cost $1,200 a month. It's twice as much as I had to be, that I was paying before. 
in the winter months, they cut our schedules back, and I'm only working three days a week and with less business on those days and fewer tips. I'm worried about how I'll keep up with the rent and bills when tips are down. I am considered by my company to be a full-time worker, so I qualify for benefits, but not all my coworkers do. I see the company hiring more part-time workers and denying more hours to people who want to be full-time and get benefits like health insurance. My whole paycheck right now goes into taxes, and I owe more taxes in a year because my hourly pay is not enough to even cover my tax bill. If I was making the full minimum wage plus tips, it could at least ensure that my taxes could be covered out of my paycheck, and I wouldn't have a huge bill hanging over my head at the end of the year. That would be more stability in my life so I could provide better for my family. Now my coworkers and I are organizing together for a fair process to form a union at our job. We want to see positive changes in the law. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Joining us now for a slightly different perspective, someone in the same industry but who holds a different role, is Imar Hutchins, who is the owner of Washington's venerable Florida Avenue Grill, a D.C. institution that I no doubt suspect several of you have frequented over the years. It was a D. Yeah. Uh, Imar has owned the grill for about nine years, and he comes to uh, ownership of this venerable institution with a very uh, diverse background as a real estate attorney and developer. He's developed condos adjacent to the grill, but has made a real commitment to making sure the grill's history uh, not only remains in D.C., but that it's also modernized for new generations who frequent the, uh, the Shaw U Street area and can hopefully live on in the future, but we bring Emar here today, not just because of the Florida Grill, but because uh, he has what you might view as a different perspective on, um, on the tip minimum wage. We often hear that this is something that is necessary for business owners to exist. In fact, that if we didn't have this tip minimum wage, these jobs would go away, these businesses would fail. Emar doesn't subscribe to that viewpoint. He's here to tell us why. Emar Hutchins, everyone. I want to thank Christian for having me. I want to acknowledge all the people from Rock here, Britton, Jeremiah, and, and others, I'm sure. Um, so, as Christian said, I'm the owner of the Florida Avenue Grill. And you might say, why is a restaurant owner here? Uh, and why would he be advocating for increasing the minimum wage, the tip minimum wage, which is only going to cost him more money? Well, it's a little, the way I look at it is, uh, the example I always give people is, let's say I have a bar, and you have a bar next door. And if I want people to stop smoking, and if I stop smoking in my bar, everybody goes to the bar next door, right? But if there's just a law that comes out, it affects everybody the same. It's neutral with respect to restaurants. It's neutral with respect to bars. So there, people still go to the place that they were going to go before, and it's just something that everybody has to deal with. And we've seen this in places like D.C. and New York, which have passed, say, anti-smoking laws. And really, it didn't affect anyone adversely with respect to any one particular other place. So the situation that we're in is that we, we pay um, slightly above the tip minimum wage. Uh, about a year ago, uh, the, the grill was approaching its 70th anniversary, right? This is our 70th year. We're proud to be the oldest soul food restaurant in the, in the country, in the world. Uh, that's a little bit of a trick because soul food is only an American phenomenon, but we're going to say in the world anyway. Uh, we're also the oldest African-American restaurant of any kind surviving. Um, so October 4th is our 70th anniversary. You know, mark the date. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I started thinking about, well, what, okay, I, I bought the grill as you alluded to, to build the building uh, next door. That was the real reason that I bought it. My personal background is I'm a vegetarian. So, I know. 
And um, so I had actually five vegetarian restaurants previously, two in D.C., which if you've been around long enough, you might have heard of them, called uh, Delights of the Garden, uh, one in Georgetown and one near Howard. But anyway, um, as we approached the 70th anniversary, I started thinking to myself, well, okay, what is... Um, I, I, I guess I should say first I maintain the grill mainly for social reasons, like most developers would have probably torn it down to get like another two units, right? But it was important to me to keep the grill because it's such an icon of D.C. history. It's a continuing source of employment for people that might not have it otherwise. One of the, you know, they, they say that Lacey, which is the former owner, would he would give a three-legged cat a job. <laughs> so, like, truly, we've hired a lot of people over the years that might not have been hired elsewhere. And... Honestly, most people mess it up, but some people surprise you. So you're giving people a chance. So the manager of the grill for many years was someone who was formerly incarcerated, you know, and I don't know how many places that would happen. So anyway, I kept it for these years for mainly a social purpose. But as we're moving forward, I said, well, if I'm going to kind of commit myself to it, then what does it have to be? What does it have to look like going forward? And I... I you know, I thought about it, and I realized that it must mean for me that I need to um, make it healthier, you know, um, that, it, that it must be a reason that I, of all people, would own the place, you know. So I kind of reluctantly came to the conclusion that it must, part of the reason must be for me to help my people, in particular, learn how to eat better. Um, but as I started thinking about the restaurant, like, De Novo, you know, from scratch, I said, well, okay, it's not enough to just think about what we serve. Let's think about the whole enterprise, you know, and let's think about the worker-restaurant relationship, you know, and is that working? And is that, is it really a healthy restaurant if it's not healthy for the people who work there? Is that possible? And so we just started kind of doing like an open source evolution. Maybe open source is not the word, but just inviting the public into our evolution, you know, one thing that, that I love about Rock and the work that you guys do is that it's, it's also, um, it's not just negative. It's also offering a uh, suggestion or a path forward, right? And um, I actually went to law school with Saru, who was the co-founder of Rock, and I didn't even realize that until I happened to look at the book and look at the picture, and I was like, oh, Saru. You know, because as I was going to evolve the, the Russian, I was like, I need to get that book behind a kitchen door. I know it's about, it's about this issue. And it wasn't until I actually looked at the book that I realized that, that fact. So we kind of reconnected. We've been working on a lot of things. And what I've been trying to do is to um, kind of like champion a new business model, I would say. And so what, what, you're, what you're referring to, Christian, is that I personally believe that we should just abolish tips period, like the, the practice of tipping. Like, I know that's an unpopular thing, and I know that's not going to probably happen anytime soon, but, like, if we want to, like, if we want to, um, okay, here's what happens. You go to a restaurant, let's say the food is $10. Well, you, need, you know you need to have 12 leaving aside the tax for a minute. You know you need to have, say, $12, or you wouldn't go to a restaurant with food for 10 So the real cost is 12 and everybody knows that. It's just like an agreement that's been made that, well, you are going to pay two directly here and to the server, and then you're going to pay 10 to the restaurant, and then they're going to give part of that 10 to them too. But when you put that together, that's what the server gets. Well, why not just charge what it is, and that's what it is? You know? There are a lot of places that, not a lot of places, there are places where tipping is allowed, where even exchanging cash is, is, is not allowed. You know? There's clubs that do that. That the Yale Club, for example, there's no money allowed to exchange. You're not allowed to tip. You know, it's just they charge what it should be, and that's what it is. So there are places that do that. I would be in favor of that. There's a lot of problems with that <laughs> because servers are very attached to tips too. You know, like we, um, when, uh, when Laura Fortman was here talking, like, about the violations in the industry, well, we can't get people to report their tips to us, period. 
like people don't want to report their tips. So like servers and restaurants are attached to this, this whole tipping thing. And what happens is people, uh, because they have these good times, you know, sometimes they want to uh, not complain about the bad times, you know, because they don't want to get put on worse shifts and all kinds of things like that. So kind of like everybody just grins and bears it, you know. But it's actually, I believe it's actually holding back both sides of the equation, you know, uh, both the restaurant and the, and the server. So, I mean, like, we're, we're talking about it now, trying to see if we could abolish tips at the grill. I mean, there's going to be a lot of resistance from that. And, of course, we would have to charge more for the food. So this is why I'm in favor of legislative um, addressing of the issue of the, the tips minimum wage, because if it's something that just happens and everyone has to deal with it, it's a level playing field. Every restaurant in D.C. does the math, or nationally, if that could happen. Uh, everybody does the math and figures out, okay, we need to go up X percent on the food. Everybody does it. You take the pill, and then every, everybody moves on, you know? People wouldn't know when they go out to eat, they're going to have to pay $12 for the thing that was 10 or $11 or whatever. But when they actually think about it, it's, they're spending the same amount of money as before. It takes the, it's called a gratuity, which means it's gratuitous, which means it doesn't actually have to happen. So, like, how many things do you know that you can go, the service is rendered, then after the fact you decide if and how much you want to pay for it? I mean, is that, can you go to a lawyer and... Say, like, after the work is done, say, I kind of didn't like the way you, like, looked at me when you were doing it, so I'm going to give you 70% of what, what the bill says here. Nothing else is like that. So it's just something that's really, like, built up and, like, encrusted <laughs> over many generations in this industry, but it's not really, I don't really think it's the best. So I know we're going to have Q&A, so I'll, I'll leave it there. All right, thank you. So I'm now going to invite all of our speakers to come up to the front. We've got some assigned seating. We'll get you mic'd up. Before we get into audience questions, I wanted to address a question first to uh, Dave and Sylvia. Just in looking at uh, the, the final proposal that you all sort of have, abolishing the tip minimum wage altogether, can you just delve more into the experiences of the states where that have already done this and how they kind of look in the restaurant industry? Because again, a guiding fear for a lot of people, even if they're not necessarily pro-restaurant industry folks is that somehow could this succeed in making people worse off? So if you could just talk a little bit more about what's happening in those states that have already done this. Sure. Uh, okay, there we go. So sure, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, you know, we know clearly from the data that workers are better off in the states where they're getting the regular minimum wage as their base wage. So there really should be no dispute about that. These the folks are doing better there. In terms of the restaurants themselves, uh, uh, you know, as, as Sylvia alluded to, the, the restaurant industry nationwide has grown dramatically over the last 20 years, faster than, than uh, you know, the private sector as a whole. But as Rock likes to point out sometimes, and, and we noted this in our report as well, even the restaurant industry themselves would admit that in the states where they're paying workers the regular minimum wage, restaurant employment is actually forecast to grow faster in those states than in the rest of the country where they're paying lower base wages. So the notion that having to pay this higher base wage to these workers is going to just kill the industry is, is just bogus. And, and the industry themselves knows this. They, they admit this in their forecast reports. So 
I mean, I think clearly this is something that would benefit the workers and also wouldn't really have any damaging effect on the employers either. Thanks. Uh, this one is from Marcy and Amber. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks believe that ultimately the uh, success or failure of uh, tipped workers when it comes to their take-home pay is entirely controlled by tipped workers. If they do a good job, then they'll get good tips. What's your experience uh, in terms of how tips do or do not correlate with the level of service? Give us some dynamics of what you experience with how people actually go about tipping. Um, I actually heard a statistic or someone that I worked with said that they'd seen a study that showed that um, actually most people decide <laughs> speak up. Uh, that most people, uh, when they go to a restaurant, they actually decide before they walk in the door what percentage they're going to tip. Um, so there's definitely instances where I see that, that um, what I receive in tip uh, is not correlated with um, my performance. And the sucky part on top of that is that sometimes the service that they get isn't all my fault. <laughs> it's not my fault if the bartender didn't see the ticket and I had to hound them because they were talking to somebody else because their tips depend on talking to that person so that they will stop and make the drink that I need to give to you. It's also not my fault when something happens in the kitchen and they burn your eggs and they have to start over. Yes, I'll do my best to communicate that with you, but I'm not a magician. <laughs> um, I, I would say that that for me, I, I do feel good in that the majority of the time, I do feel that most people are fair. They want to reward people for giving them good service, and that's awesome. Um, but it's just really unfortunate uh, to live in a city where my wage does depend directly on what you choose to give me. Um, and uh, anybody that decides that they have a good reason to not give me a, a fair wage does directly impact my life. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, was, I feel the same way as what you said. People are going to tip what they tip no matter what I do. I go above and beyond, it, and they don't necessarily tip above and beyond. I think another um, that, that's already been touched on a little bit, that even if people were all good tippers, somebody still has to cover the hours where there's not going to be very many customers. Mm -hmm. And so there's no uh, opportunity there then to, to, to make, a, you know, more money off of tips because you're just relying, at least for, you know, a, a large part of the day, restaurants aren't very busy. There's a lot of restaurants that are 24 hours a day. So uh, there's just not an opportunity to make more no matter how wonderful of a, a service that you might um, provide if you don't have any customers. Any more I, I would also add that a lot of people, customers don't even know um, yeah. the, the waitresses and waiters don't make a lot of money. Like, I've, my father lives in Kentucky, and, you know, he goes to, like, a, um, is, that, is that me? I don't know. Okay. He goes to, like, a, you know, like a Golden Corral type of place, and he'll leave him a tip, but it's just, like, you know, a dollar or whatever change he has. I'm like, Dad, well, you know, they, that, that person, uh, that's all they're getting. He's like, really? You know, like some people honestly don't know because it's not something that's, that's talked about. And people assume that you're working there, you have the uniform on, that, that they're paying you more. So that's, um, that's one thing. Another thing, just from a restaurant owner perspective, like you're also giving the, the power to the people. You're not paying them, right? So I would rather not, I'd rather that the place paid them instead of, the customer because you're going to be accountable to who pays you. So mm -hmm. if you can, if we could work that out, that would be preferred. Just one other thing I'll add on that. I, there we go. Uh, is that this isn't, isn't something that we looked at, but um, uh, Professor Michael Lynn at Cornell studies this issue extensively, and, and his studies show that tipping is, is often discriminatory, that, mm -hmm. uh, that black servers tend to get lower tips than white servers, even for the same reported quality of service. But also the interesting thing is that there's a perception in the industry that, that black customers don't tip as well as white customers. And so 
uh, servers of, of all races will, will tend to give worse service to their black customers because they're expecting a lower tip from those folks. So that's, again, that's not good for a business owner who wants all of their customers to be getting good service. And let's explore that before we get to audience questions. This whole idea, does this make good business sense to have sort of these systems, this regime in place? Marcy, you brought out that, um, you know, this, uh, such a low uh, tip worker minimum wage is easy for employers. They don't have to think about what are good business practices. And, and Imar, maybe we can start with you. Do you think that leveling the playing field as you um, sort of identify as a first step would actually create an environment where businesses are succeeding or failing based on their level of, of innovation and, and, and performance as opposed to just carrying cheap labor and, and, and getting by that way? Well, I think, I'm not sure of the answer to that question, but I do think that it would make it easier for someone that wants to pay more, right? Because right now, a person who wants to pay more has to go out there on a limb because they are going to have to increase their prices relative to everybody else to do it. To um, so I'm not, I mean, the honest answer to your question is I don't know if in the end it would be better or not. I just can address the, the fact that one restaurant is going to have to charge more to pay people more, and it's going to have to, the way people are very, um, you know, Price conscious and and you know also I would on that on that point like I think the ultimate change in the tipping culture is going to come from the customer side because restaurants restaurants you know they are kind of like a very follow follow the leader type of industry so like if somebody paints their door red and and they are like a popular restaurant next week everybody will paint their door red you know it's just they, that's the way they operate. So if people want, uh, if people come in and they're wanting, you know, is this, you know, uh, uh, free range uh, organic turkey, and people will say, yeah, oh, we, that's what we're doing, right? So when customers come in and they start saying, well, you know, what is your policy with respect to tip the workers, you know, or how many people of color do you have in the front of the house, you know, or and things like that. When people start asking these questions and becoming more aware of, of the industry, then the industry will change because no one wants to be on the wrong side of history. Hmm. Okay, let's move to some questions from our audience. Yes, and please just do us a favor, stand up so that your uh, question is captured by the camera microphones. Yes. Hi. Um, so I think one thing we haven't talked about is um, that in a lot of restaurants, the management uh, the servers to share their tips with other mm -hmm. workers, right? So they don't even get to keep everything that they have. Right. Um, and, and, and I've also management kids, which also kind of takes a percentage of the tips. I'm wondering if people could talk a little bit about, about that. Well, All right, so who okay. wants to start with that? Well, in the restaurant where I work at, we do have to share our tips. We tip out our bartenders to ensure that we get our drinks so we can serve our tables. Um, and so we don't get to keep 100% of what we taken. Yeah. I don't know how it is where you work. It's the same where I work. Um, I would say I probably tip out about close to 25% of my tips between uh, tipping out the bartender, food runner, bussers. There's a lot. Um, and so there's a, a giant portion of my day that, that goes out the window. You give money to me and then I give it to the restaurant to give back to other employees. So I'm also subsidizing my fellow workers' wages. Yeah, I think well, this, this idea no. of what we, what, what we refer to as these kind of secondary tips is not ever talked about hardly, you know, because you know, it, it has all kinds of implications. You know, you really have to ask yourself, how much in tips do these workers have to make to be able to make ends meet, to be able to tip out, and to be able to buy almost all their own health care, sick leave, vacation leave. That's how you have to think about it. If you're getting a base wage of 277 or 213, you need a lot of money in tips. And what this research is showing that they're not, you know, most workers, especially in these lower tip credit states, are certainly uh, not, not making it. 
Well, I, I, would, just, I would say that I, I personally, um, we have a similar kind of thing. They tip out maybe a, a percentage of their um, thing to other, to the server assistants and runners and people like that. But I'm in favor of, I'm personally in favor of the tips being shared through the whole building um, and paying people more equally throughout the whole building. Then you create a, a teamwork type of mentality um, instead of like a, us against them. So, we, you know, a lot of times, um, I don't know if that's me, but a lot of times restaurants break down into, you know, the front of the house against the back of the house, you know. The servers against the bar, you know, then day shift against the night shift, and all these kind of things. Whereas, you know, we're actually like theorizing right now, trying to figure out our next move. But we're thinking about: is it possible to just pull everything for the week and distribute it according to some formula? Is it, you know, we're we're trying to to break that down. And I'm probably a lot of people would be interested if they could see a way to do it. <laughs> yeah. You trailblaze, you uh, you can provide a model, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I feel like raising the tip minimum wage across the whole board would do, mm -hmm. would be to make everybody equal between the... Well, that's that's possible. So you're just, I mean, what we're describing here today is actually a system that is fairly complex in how it works. You know, for the end user, the customer, the, the, they think the calculation is difficult figuring 15, 18, 20 percent, is it pre-tax, post-tax, what? But really, you all are talking about a system that not only gets into a lot of reporting, a lot of bean counting, a lot of figuring out who you share with, how it's shared, uh, but then on the business owner side, allotting shifts so that theoretically there is some equity and all kinds of things that go into this. Um, is there ever a point for any of you, um, speaking principally to Marcy, Amber, and Emar, where it's it's worth it, or you know, do the good times uh, sort of as I think Emar, you were saying that gets people complacent and really ultimately complaining because the good times are so good. Oh, I wish that were the case. <laughs> well, I would say <laughs> it also depends on the restaurant. You know, it it's not absolutely. it's not fair to say like restaurants because there are restaurants where people make six figures, mm -hmm. you know, serving, uh, and there are restaurants where you know people you know, don't make anything. So they, they, they run the gamut. I would say in, in a city like D.C., you know, the restaurants are a little more pricey than they are in some places. So theoretically, the tips might be better, but there's, like, so many factors that, that go into the whole thing. I mean, uh, does, it, does it make sense? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like, we have to... They, I mean, for a restaurant owner, there's so many things to deal with already, right? And and there's just, you almost have to have, like, a, most restaurant owners, you know, we they don't have, like, an accounting department and this and that. They don't have people that can, that can handle everything that has to be done. Like, we certainly don't. So that's why simplifying would be, would actually be better. And most restaurants... They, they make decisions on most small restaurants, not large ones. We make decisions based on what we think will work, just without a lot of analysis. So, like, if you, for example, when we added, like, paid vacation and sick days, we didn't really do regression analysis and see if it's going to make sense or not. We just said, well, somebody has been working for, like, a year, you know, then it, they should be able to have a vacation. And we just did it. And it's the kind of thing that some of these changes, you're never going to make it if you sit there and, like, really try to figure it out. But if you just maybe do it, then you'll do it, and the world will keep spinning. One Dave. thing that I'll add to that that uh, you were getting at, Christian, is that, you know, because the, the system as it is right now is, is, is pretty complicated, uh, for a worker to try and ensure compliance with the law, I mean, it, it, this is unique to, to tipped occupations, that it's up to the worker to really ensure that they're getting at least the regular minimum wage. Mm -hmm. If you're a, a, a waitress at a restaurant, you have to basically keep track of your hours for a given week, keep track of all the tips that you got over that time period, keep track of whatever your your boss, your employer was, was paying you as a base wage, and keep in mind this, this includes both 
cash tips, credit card tips, uh, you know, factoring in the tips that you tipped out to those secondary tipped earners that we talked about, and then do the math to make sure that you were getting the regular minimum wage, at least the regular minimum wage. And if not, it's, it falls on that server to go to her boss, the person that sets her schedule, that determines where she's going to work in the restaurant, that determines you know, whether she's going to keep her job, and say, look, you didn't pay me enough. You owe me more money. I mean, it's not realistic, and I'm sure the workers can, can attest to this, that, that they're going to go and do that because they don't want to lose their job. So um, that's part of the reason why doing away with the tip minimum wage would make it a lot easier for these workers. They wouldn't have to have that concern. But I think also it's important to know for the, for the business owners, you know, even for the, the good actors who want to do the right thing, this system is difficult for them to, to comply with. It's, it's difficult for them to understand exactly how to do this. Uh, you know, Sylvia maybe could say more, but I mean, the, the law says that, uh, that, that the workers are supposed to get at least the regular minimum wage when you include their base wage plus tips for a given work week. But it doesn't define what a work week is very clearly. It says it's any 168-hour period. And so because these workers have such erratic shifts, and when does their work week start? When does it end? Uh, you know, just all these things that makes it more complicated for, for good actors to try and do the right thing. Yeah. If I could just say something on that, David, that all those things would have to happen on the server end every week for the restaurant to be in compliance. So it's no wonder that it's... 80% violation rate in the industry because, I mean, what server is running spreadsheets, you know, keeping track of their tips every day and reporting it every week to the restaurant so that they can, you know, be in compliance. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very complicated system and a, a simpler, you know, more equitable system would be better. And it, and it probably does involve paying people more, you know. I would like to note real quick on the same topic yeah. that it's not just that servers are lazy and don't want to do the record keeping. It's that, quite frankly, um, it's not a very transparent system. I don't always know exactly what I took in, especially when um, I don't get to count my tips until after my um, uh, tip out is, is taken. And I'm not sure, because they don't give me a copy of the report, they keep the report. Oh, wow. And so I don't know how much I made in credit card tips versus cash tips. Did I actually keep any of my cash tips? Or were those all taken by the restaurant for my tip out along with some of my credit card tips? It's very, very confusing. And at the end of a long work day, who wants to sit down and figure that out? So. <laughs> because right. you're not paid for that time that it would take to actually figure it out and monitor it. That too. Ross. That too. Oh. I defer to Heidi if you'll come back to me. <laughs> we'll think about it. There were other hands, so we'll see. Right. That's right. Right. And in fact, I believe they take out Social Security as if they're paying the minimum wage. Right. Right. But what I'm what I'm I definitely do. They take out Social Security, and if you owe any income tax, and so they're making an assumption that may be wrong, and they're the ones who are supposed to figure out what they're trying. But what I'm referring to is the cash. Bye, Sylvia. So yeah, no, even the good actors, though, this would be so difficult because these are these are work hours that are very, you know, up and down. People they're not working necessarily forty hours a week, eight hours a day. Even a good actor, a good employer, at what point do they stop and say, okay, now I'm going to try to figure out everybody's hours that vary a lot in this industry and vary a lot over time for even the same worker. I'm going to figure out what I paid them. I'm going to figure out what they made in tips minus what they tipped out. I mean, yeah, this is so, it, 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 even for somebody who wanted to do it, it seems uh, really impossible, especially, uh, I mean, in, in, as you just heard, individual workers would find it difficult. I think it would, it's impossible for um, even the good actors, um, you know. And then you, you, you are supposed to be the one to go to your boss and say, hey, you know, you owe me money. And believe me, this does happen. When you think about these 24-hour restaurants, if you're working a 2 a.m. shift, there's times when people are not making the minimum wage. Um, what I was referring to in particular was the cash tips. So the server is the only one who would know how much they were tipped in cash. So we, most restaurants would not be able to know that unless the server told them. And Ross, and then we'll get to you. So yes. my, my question follows on what Heidi just asked, which is what happens uh, in terms of Social Security? Is the employer responsible? 
responsible for, you, you have to assume as an employer that the person did make the minimum wage. And, and then, so at a minimum, are you deducting a, enough for Social Security, you know, paying in on and giving the person credit for their, their hours uh, based on the minimum wage? Well, that's why we have ADP. <laughs> <laughs> Because we, you know, they they do it all for us. But yeah, I mean, it's based on what was reported to them. So it, it it's, it's taken out. So what Ross is alluding to this whole idea that you know ultimately, when it comes to Social Security taxes, if you will, payroll taxes, if you will, um, you know, workers and employers are responsible for a certain amount. And if you've got all of these complications in record keeping. Is there any way to, to know that people are actually paying appropriately because this has real issues for, for workers on the back end when, when they re retire, making sure they're receiving the full benefits uh, that they are entitled to? So it's the social security system is getting you know, the, all of the taxes that are required for right. keep the system going. Right. Right. Yes. And, you know, Dave, maybe you can take first crack at it because, you know, you, I know you have thoughts on it. And this is a difficult crowd where we could actually do this, but it would be interesting to do a survey on the street to see how many people actually understand when they pay their 15, 18, 20 percent, whether or not that is because the server themselves is making a sub-minimum wage. And therefore, they're making the mental calculus that this is going to making sure this person has adequate money. I don't know the answer, but I suspect... <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> so, so just to make sure I understand your question correctly, you're you're asking whether if we did away nationally with the the tip minimum wage, the sub minimum wage, would tips go down or would would people uh, tip less would, or would the um, average amount that the person is getting paid um, for their service right. go down? Because like in Europe or something, they don't tip as much. Um, so I don't know if you might have that same sure. thing, right? It might become like you said, gratuitous. Right. So. So I guess what I would say on this is that, uh, you know, first of all, I, I don't think, the, I think the vast majority of Americans don't understand how the system works right now. They just know that it's sort of expected of them to tip somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. Uh, and, you know, however, and that they kind of have a sense that it's, that that's an important source of income for these workers, but they don't know how important it is. So, uh, you know, I think that even if we did away with the tip minimum wage, I think most people wouldn't know that there was any difference in the pay structure for these workers. But also, you know, as, as, uh, as we said in our presentation, there's already seven states where this is already the case, where these workers already get the full minimum wage. About 18% of all tipped workers are, are operating in a system where they're getting the regular minimum wage plus tips. And I'm pretty sure that in California, people still tip somewhere between 15 and 20, 25% would be my guess. Uh, and so, you know, there, there hasn't been any sort of cultural shift in these places where workers are already getting a decent base, wa base wage from their employers. Um, the other thing I'll note on that is that sometimes you also hear this concern that, oh, if we did away with the tip minimum wage, uh, restaurants would have to institute a service charge and that, and that uh, you know, customers wouldn't like that. They don't like to see a service charge. But again, I would point to the fact that we already, this is not a new idea to, to do away with the tip minimum wage. We already have seven states where this has been policy for you know, 20 plus years. And 
every time I've visited California and been to a restaurant, I, I haven't seen any service charges. Uh, I mean, maybe in a handful of cases, I, maybe. But the point being that I don't think this would dramatically change norms uh, in, around tipping or the way that we, we pay workers. Yes. change awareness in terms of customers, but also city laws, state laws, federal laws. Um, in terms of a strategy, if we could only do one of those things in the next year, what would be the most important thing in terms of long-term Why don't we hear first from our organizers, Marcy and Amber. <laughs> so the most important thing in terms of, of long-term change. Yeah, like what could be the leverage point that could shift all of them? Oh gosh, I think that's a. I think that's a very complex question, but um, uh, from my personal perspective, having had experience uh, working for the full minimum wage and the tips minimum wage, uh, to be really frank, I really don't see good reasons not to good reasons to not get rid of the tips minimum wage. Uh, the Oregon restaurant industry is doing just fine, and my tips were pretty much on average the same as they were here as far as most people tipped 20%, 18%. You had the handful that tipped less. Um, but uh, it, it, it would just make such a, such a world of difference. Um, and I think that, to, to be honest, I, I personally think that actually changing that law would be easier than changing a giant cultural mindset around tipping. Absolutely. And Amber, you talked about organizing. Unionizing. Yes, we. I. That's where I think what will change it the best way and the fastest way. That's why we are fighting to unionize the airport for fairness across the workplace, job security and and pay is what we all need, not just servers. Everybody. Yeah. Okay. We'll go to this gentleman over here in the back. I think we, we might have it. I don't. It's not something that we, we publish anywhere. I'm happy to share it with you afterwards if you'd like. I, I would say this. It's, it's, like the, uh, um, it's like the poverty rates. While the poverty rates are, are much lower in states that have no sub-minimum wage, that have, ha, that have to pull, uh, to have to pay the regular minimum wage, they're still far too high. So, you know, in general, this is a low-wage worker industry. So what we can do, even, you know, it's not just as simple as getting rid of, I, I don't think so, um, is, is, I think it's a good very first step to get rid of the, uh, the tipped minimum wage. But we see with the benefits, it's not only low wage, but it's low benefit. So we have the problem of, of uh, high poverty, albeit much higher in the low tip credit states, but it's still far too high even in the states that don't have uh, a sub-minimum wage. So it's an industry that needs to be kind of looked at as a whole, not just wages, but also uh, benefits. Thanks. And we had another question here on the side. Yes? So, hey, hey I'm Britton Lofton with Rocky Nine. Just a quick question. So we know uh, tip workers are majority packed into the restaurant industry, but then there are other tip workers. Like I learned taxi cab drivers mm -hmm. were also tip workers. I learned um, 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 nail salon attendants were also tip workers, right? And I think the law says if you make $30 and I can pay you that tip minimum wage. So I just wanted to ask Sylvia and David, would you guys, if you, you know, tap into some of those pieces? You know, so we did, we did look at the occupations that, uh, you know, we think are predominantly tipped. And there are, you know, workers outside of the, the restaurant industry, as, as Britton was saying, where workers are, that are tipped occupations, people like, now salon attendants, casino workers, uh, barbers, hairstylists, taxi cab drivers, massage therapists. And, you know, we, we our focus was on changing the, the tip wage policy. And uh, so we tried to look at the, the folks that we thought are the most likely to be getting the sub-minimum wage. Um, 
And, you know, a taxi cab driver or a massage therapist, hopefully they're getting something higher than 213 but, but Britain's right. You know, the, if they're making at least $30 a month in tips, then technically their employer could be paying them as little as, as $213. Uh, and, and I should note that, that $30 in tips, if that, if that sounds odd as a number to pick for the amount of tips, it's because, and maybe you can correct me on this, that originally that was a value that was set something like 30 years ago. Right. And they just never bothered to update it. Well, it was originally 20, I believe, in 1966, and they updated it to 30, and I believe around 1970. So uh, that that number has never been been changed either, which it would be well over $100 uh, if it were updated today. But I think this is this brings up another larger question. There are folks who are not necessarily pay the tip wage that that actually receive tips, and so that's another big gray area. Um, I know that there's been talk uh, recently of, uh, it was one of the airports here on the East Coast um, trying to get the, the, the folks who um, help handicapped workers get to uh, their gates in wheelchairs. They wanted to make them tip workers. But in an eight-hour day, how, how, long, how many of those folks could you, you, know, could you actually assist? Um, also, pizza delivery. I mean, if you're going to make those folks tip workers, how you know, even if you were busy the entire eight-hour shift and you're driving around delivering, how many pizzas could you possibly deliver? Um, so there's, again, all of these problems with the definition of, of who is a tip worker and what that would mean. Uh, but, but clearly, some of these occupations that they're trying to drag in and saying, hey, you're a, really a tipped worker. Now, and again, there's the difference between do you receive, like, some tips or are you a truly a tip worker that could that could have a chance, maybe, of living off of your tips? And those are two really different uh, things. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Okay, Rachel. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, Marcy and Amber, for for contributing today. It's um, here's a question that I get a lot when I talk about the the tip minimum wage, and I've for reference, never been a tip worker. I know what I would say to this, and I think, Marcy, you alluded to it a little bit when you said how quickly you were able to get a job in the restaurant industry. Mm -hmm. But I get a lot of pushback from people who say, well, if tip workers don't like the tips that they're getting, why don't they get another job in a different industry? Um, so for the record, can you just speak to that? Oh, my. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to speak to the record on that one. Um, it's not like I haven't been applying for jobs that's every hour that I'm not at work, I am at home on my computer looking and applying for jobs. Um, my laptop is full of applications. Uh, and I think the, the, the secondary uh, dangerous aspect to that argument is uh, uh, we still have such a high unemployment rate. Um, the economy is so loose right now uh, that there Management can easily make the argument, if you don't want to be here, I can find somebody else today. I can walk out on the street right now and find somebody else who would be happy to take your job. And it makes it very difficult to organize, especially in smaller restaurants. I want to organize, um, but, uh, but the, the restaurant industry, smaller uh, businesses make it a lot more difficult. Um, I hope that answers your question. But, but I think even more important, somebody's going to work at that job, mm -hmm. whether it's, it's, it's somebody, you know, one of these uh, women or, you know, somebody is going to fill that job. So we can't just put it, you know, the onus is on the worker. If you want a better job, go get another job. I mean, just because, you know, you might not have the skills to get another job or maybe you're not, you're, you're not mobile so you can't move to maybe where there's another job. This is one of the fastest growing industries in the country. So we have to look at the position, not the worker in the position, and the, the job and make that a, a better paying and a better quality job. I'd like to, as we close out, I'd like to um, explore the vulnerability component, which this last question raises. Uh, we have two young women who work in the industry. There's been research that's looked into the degree at which women are made even further vulnerable um, due to sexual harassment in the workplace, due to customers who, who view uh, servers as uh, you know, their employees and therefore needing to take a lot of <laughs> abuse, harassment from them. I just like your thoughts on whether or not this industry actually does um, facilitate the worst among us on both the customer and the employer side, if you have anything to share about that. Ooh, I do think it does. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, we have to take it. In order for us to make the money that we make, people can say and do whatever they want to us, and we don't have any stand to be able to tell them, no, you can't talk to me like that. Just that's how it is. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, when you work in a very lubricated environment, uh, the absolutely. chances of that happening skyrocket, especially over the course of one shift. The longer people are there, the more they drink. Um, and, and, um, and it makes people think that they can do things that they wouldn't otherwise in their right mind do. Um, yeah. And Imar, you were talking about the whole relationship of whether or not your, your waiters are, are, are sort of loyal to you or to their customers. If you're a business owner and you see uh, a, you know, one of your employees being abused, I'm not saying you personally, but it seems like that puts you in an awfully difficult circumstance, alienating the customer uh, or protecting your worker. Right, and, and that's why I agree with, with them that the, the system has to change because right now everybody knows that it's dependent on the gratuity from the, from the customer. And I, sometimes people don't leave a tip, or sometimes they leave a really uh, insignificant tip. And those are the ones, there's, sure there's people that go over, but those are the ones that would be uh, eliminated if there were an across the board uh, wage. And then you would take the, you sometimes, you know how they say the customer is always right? The customer is not always right, <laughs> you know? Sometimes the customer is wrong. A uh, customer deserves to be heard, right. but the customer is not always right. right. So, like, I think what, what the women on the panel who work in restaurants are addressing is those cases when sometimes the customer is wrong. And sometimes, you know, the, I, I would say that the, the culture as, as existing contributes to not saying anything to that customer, both on the, on the establishment side and on the server side. But hopefully the kind of changes we're talking about could address it. But, but also, and I, I've logged in over seven years in this industry, uh, it's, it's sometimes the problem is coming from the manager, the manager side. Mm. Oh, yeah. um, because you, you're dependent on the manager to set the schedule, who knows the, lucr the more lucrative shifts, for instance. You know, the, a manager who, who could um, be, be treating you unfairly just as customers do and, and, and could right. penalize you greatly if you're moved from a, a Friday night shift to, you know, the Monday or Tuesday afternoon shift. So it's not just a problem with customers. It's also this, this um, you know, a typical employer-employee power imbalance that is magnified in this industry. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's all of our time for today. I'd like for you to join me in thanking our panel. Thank you all for attending. If for some reason uh, you'd like to share a video of today's proceedings, you can find the video for this event at www.epi.org. You all have a great rest of your day.